and uh, I hope that we can have a, a blessed time together. Um, I like to begin with a word of prayer, and if anyone has anything special they want to mention that we can pray about together, that would be fine. Um, no requirement for that, but if you feel so inclined to mention something, everything going well? How long are you staying? Just till Monday. Okay, quick trip. Ohio, right? Ohio, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tremendous. Good to see you again, Susan. Glad to have you. Oh, totally, yeah. There's a lot of new things happening today, so yeah, Karen. Oh, where does he live? You said he's a cousin. Yeah. I like to ask, is he a believer? Good. Yeah, so we want to just encourage him in, in that, and we'll pray for him as well. Okay, Cassie. Yeah, yeah. And the Hoyt family and cousin David. Let's oh, I Thank you. I appreciate that and uh, always covet your prayers. Thank you. All right, let's bow our heads. Father, uh, it is your day. Uh, this is a, a beautiful Sabbath day to be in your house and among your people, Lord. As we uh, begin our uh, fellowship, as we begin our study, we turn to you, Father. First, we praise your name and thank you for being our glorious Savior, a Lord worthy of our worship. And God, we honor you and we, we love you today. And Father, we, we bring our petit petitions and requests before you, knowing, Lord, that you are not uh, being informed uh, but, Lord, we are joining our heart with yours about these concerns and these, these requests, Father. We lift up David and his upcoming uh, procedure that he has uh, on his esophageal uh, cancer, if I remember right, in Nebraska. God, encourage him. Uh, may he have the support and, and, uh, and love that he needs from his friends and family there in that community and, and be with the uh, process that that would be um, the, the necessary thing for him to move on in his life and bring healing. Uh, Lord, we bring, uh, lift up the Hoyt family uh, and their uh, grief, time of grief and struggle over the loss of life in such tragic circumstances, God. It reminds us of our great need of your return, Lord, because of the, the, the lack of hope and despair that seems to be um, so prevalent today. So we just uh, pray for the comforter to be with the Hoyt family. And Lord, we lift up a fellow minister by the name of Buzz, uh, part of the Kettering community. Um, who is uh, still suffering greatly in the hospital. And uh, God, we don't know all the factors, but we just pray for healing. We pray for comfort. We pray for courage. Uh, we pray for wisdom on behalf of the staff that is trying to help him. We pray that his family would be uh, a, a strength for him and that they would find strength in you. And, and finally, Lord, I, uh, I do uh, request your special intervention in my ministry and life and uh, that this would be a church filled with your spirit and a place um, where people can come and find peace and joy and hope in you. So, Lord, we lift all these things up before you, and uh, God, we look forward to this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, we use uh, the quarterly here, and uh, that's a, a good thing to do. We're kind of in the middle of this quarterly called The Promise. It's uh, an evaluation of God's covenant. Welcome, guys. Glad that you're with us. A uh, little change in our format, but glad you found it. And Edgar and Kenneth, glad to have you guys. So we're on Lesson 5. It begins on page 38. If you have the physical quarterly, it's called Children of the Promise. And all of these are evaluations of the covenant. And covenant, and, and forgive me for those of you who've been studying this for a while, if there's anything redundant. Covenant, you know, in a, in a way the word promise has been kind of undercut today because promises are broken so often. 
Many people, when they hear the word promise, they kind of go, yeah, well, you promise, but I don't know. Promises don't have the strength that they used to have. So the word covenant has a bit stronger sense. It really means a sacred promise. It's a higher level of a promise. And those are the promises that God talks about. Um, They're all sacred promises coming from God, and they have that idea of covenant. So today's lesson is on the children of the promise. The memory text comes from Matthew 28, 20. It is one of the last promises Jesus gives us before he goes back to heaven after his earthly ministry. Right there at the end of the book of Matthew, he says, Lo, I am with you, how often? Always, even till the end of the world. Now, is that a promise? It's an interesting thing. As Jesus is leaving, he's saying, I will be with you. What is it? How does he say that? How, how, how does that work to, to say, I'm leaving, but I'm always with you? What does he mean by that? Okay, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings to us the presence of God, which is why the deity of the Holy Spirit is so important to to uh, uh, Christian communities. Because if the Holy Spirit is anything less than God, well, then Jesus' promise is hard to understand there, isn't it? If he says, I'm with you, um, we expect that to mean everything that he is is with us, not a part or not a lesser or a, 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 a subjugated or, or a subordinate. So through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we have the promise of the presence of Jesus with us at all times and the Father as well. So there's an interesting story there on the first page um, talking about um, a a father and and uh, counseling his child uh, in the water did you did you read that little story yeah so they get they get caught up in the waves and the father realizes um, I don't have the strength to get back to shore and and pull my son with me so I'm gonna counsel my son how to stay afloat then I'm gonna get to shore and then we will uh, mount the rescue and find the sun. And it was several hours, if I remember right, before they find the sun. And the sun is just, you know, just floating on the, on the back of the waves, like just having a good time. And they said, well, weren't you worried? He said, why should I worry? My father told me how to stay safe. Um, father said um, I could float all day on my back and that he would come for me. So I just swam and floated because I knew he'd come. That's from a story by HMS Richards. Um, and so that's kind of the story that we have with Jesus. The Father, you know, has to go uh, about his business, but he gives us the wisdom to how to keep from drowning, and we know that he is returning for us. Yeah, he was, he was quite the storyteller. So we want to turn in our lesson to Genesis. Um, these are largely surrounding the life of Abraham. Um, in our lesson today. So Genesis chapter 15, these are going to be pretty pivotal verses for us as we go through uh, children of the promises. Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 to 3. And would anyone care to read those verses for us this morning? Genesis 15, Joe? Genesis 15, verses 1 to 3 would be great. Go for it. So here in Genesis 15, God comes to Abraham in a special vision and gives him uh, a promise, uh, gives him some hope. I think it's important to remember the context of these stories too. Do you remember what happened in Genesis 14? Do you remember the story of of, of Lot getting kidnapped and the the war with the kings? Okay, so Abram is still a, a new person in the promised land, all right? He's still a sojourner. He is not an established tribe there. He's a visitor. He's an alien. And as was very common at that time, there were lots of wars. There were lots of raids. There was lots of thievery. There was lots of destruction and violence. And he gets caught up in it. Okay, he is affected by it. He uh, himself is uh, 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 affected. And uh, I think it's the story when Lot also uh, gets uh, kidnapped. 
And he bands together and actually goes to war with these other tribes. And they are successful, and, and he is thankful. He's able to return uh, uh, the, the things that had been lost to him. And then he meets Melchizedek. Okay, we remember this story. But you can imagine, as Abram is reflecting on this, he's wondering about his security in this land. Now, God has blessed him. God was with him during that, and he was victorious, okay? And he shows his thanks, thankfulness to God by, by paying the tithe and, and uh, showing that God is still in control of his life, okay? But he realizes that he is still in a very vulnerable time, in a very vulnerable situation. And it's in that context that God comes to Abraham. He says, do not fear, Abram. Don't fear. I am a shield to you your reward shall be very great. And so I want to talk about the Lord being a shield for a moment. What does that mean? Okay, we understand it's basic idea. Shield is a protection. Gotcha. Very good. So God's going to protect us. Well, that's fine. Let's, let's tease that out a little bit more. Now remember, Abram had just come from a fairly desperate situation. He was at war. He had been robbed. His family had been jeopardized. Was God a shield to Abram then? So God was still with him then, but does that mean that nothing bad ever happened to him? So, so just, does God being a shield to us mean that we never suffer? Right? Okay, sometimes we suffer for our own benefit. What, what do you mean by that? I mean, come on. Okay. Right. And I think it's very true. Aren't some of the greatest lessons we've ever learned been through our trials and through our mistakes? You know, some things we wouldn't learn unless we learned, you know, the hard way. Okay. Anyone else? What does it mean that God is our shield? We've already identified that it does not mean that we will never suffer, suffer uh, uh, bad circumstances. Okay? Is God our shield when we get cancer? Or did he stop being our shield and that therefore we got cancer? Is God our shield when there's a traffic accident? So, so how does that work? I and mean, think about this from the context of someone who's new to the faith, all right? And you're going about saying, hey, it's great to be a Christian. God loves us so much. He's given us his promises. It's a covenant promise. It's a sacred promise. He promises to be our shield. Wow, that's great. But if that's true, how come I'm, I don't feel very protected right now? I got all these troubles, is God, is God not keeping his promise? Is God weak in his promise? He's trying to be our shield, but he's just overcome. Sometimes we throw these things around without realizing that uh, there's, there's uh, uh, thinking people out there who are wondering, what does this mean? Anyone else have any thoughts on that? Okay. I say it's a... Okay. Okay, there are conditions. Is it possible that at times we withdraw from God's shielding protection on our, from our own decision? I think it's very possible. God's shield is not this absolute thing that even if you oh, don't want it, even if you reject it, even if you cast me aside, there are things that we can do to say, God, I am going to step outside of your protection and when God gives us shielding advice and we say, no, thank you, all right, and we go about saying, you know what, God, I know you say you're going to be my shield, but I'm going to smoke four packs a day and nothing bad ever happened to me or else you're a liar. Now, does that make sense? Now, so we understand sometimes our actions take us outside of God's expectations and God's shield, okay? So we can understand that to a degree. All right, let's get into some passages here. The des designation of God as a shield appears here for the first time in the Bible, and it's the only time God used it to reveal himself, uh, even if the other passages use the term to speak about God. 
Um, so what does that mean? I want to look up a couple passages that talk about this. Psalm 91.4, and then someone else, Ephesians 6.16. Psalm 91.4, will someone grab that verse for us? You know, Psalm 91 is a pretty popular psalm. He who abides in the shelter of the Almighty will abide in the shadow of the Most High. Psalm 91, verse uh, 4, I'm sorry. Okay, read the last part of verse 4. You said his truth. And batten. And buckle. Okay, and buckle. Mine says bulwark, so I, w I wanted to see. You know, different translations use it. So it's obviously part of the, the armament, you might say, okay, that secures these things to us. But notice what it says here. God is promising, I'm going to cover you. Um, in verse 4, under, your, under his wings, you're going to seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield. God's faithfulness is a shield. What does that mean? Any thoughts? How is God being faithful to us? A reason for hope, reason for trust, reason to understand that He is a shield. Okay. 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 So Okay. Yeah, so very similar to what we talked about earlier, how God works through our trials to illustrate his plan and his power. He doesn't always keep us from trials. Let's touch on that Ephesians 6 uh, verse here. Um, you'll recognize it when you hear it. Ephesians 6:16. 6, Did someone grab that verse for us? very good. So this comes from the armor of God, right? And he says, above all, or in addition to all, take up the shield of faith, right? The shield of faith, which is able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. So does the shield of faith mean that the devil never sends his flaming arrows at you? No. Okay. But it means that God will be there with us and will not allow those arrows to overcome us. Uh, there's, there's, uh, I, I, I'm sorry to, to, to dwell on this at such length. I realize there's more to the lesson than, than this first page. But I think there's two ditches to this idea of God's promise of protection. Two extremes that are neither uh, helpful to us nor illustrate the, 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 um, the, uh, the main idea of what God's a protective promise is for us. One is the idea that God's promise of protection protects us from all circumstance, and we've talked about that. Okay, God's, God's promise to protect, God's promise to be a shield does not mean that we will not experience circumstances. Okay, In the history of the world, how many people have died? Pretty sure all of them have, right? Now, doesn't God give us the promise of everlasting life? Right? So God's promise of protection does not mean we will never die in this world, does not mean we'll never suffer evil in this world, never have evil consequences or evil circumstances in our life. And I think that that one is, is fairly obvious. Um, uh, I, I can't think of a significant Bible character, no matter how holy they were, that didn't suffer evil. And, and if, we, if Jesus is our example in all things, did he experience suffering and evil? So it, it's fairly easy to avoid, or at least uh, psychologically try to avoid that side of the ditch and say, well, God being a shield to me does not mean I will never suffer uh, in, my, in my Christian walk. It does not mean that the devil, devil will never attack me. But then the other ditch that we sometimes run to and can be just as, 
as damaging is the idea, well, if that's the case, then what God's shield means is that only the things that happen to me will be God's plan for my life. And then when you get the idea that, that when bad things do happen, well, God must have wanted that because God would never let anything happen to me that he doesn't want to happen. So when evil happens to me, I must deserve it. Or, or, or God, this is God's plan for my life. Uh, he must have wanted me to have cancer. He must have wanted me to suffer a, a significant loss in my life. And we kind of get into this, uh, this and, and by the way, there are entire you know, theologies about this and, and, and entire denominations that really embrace that, where no matter what's happening, the, praise God! Oh, I just got that phone call. The doctor said the test came back you know, positive. I've got you know, stage four cancer. Oh, praise God! That's his plan for your life. Isn't he a wonderful... Now, I'm being a little facetious, but people are actually like this, particularly in the South. This is highly a, kind of a, a Baptist and fundamentalist uh, um, idea. But even in my previous context in the Pentecostal church, this was very prominent. Whatever happens, that's God's plan for your life. Okay? Now, those two are, are both unreasonable. Okay? And now, I'm not suggesting that God is weak on either side and that, that he, He's just allowing the devil to toy with us. Yep, all of God's people will suffer tribulation. Shof. That's right. Yes. To be no way. Yes. Yes. That's right. Well put, well put. And that's where I think the idea of the shield of faith comes in, that regardless of what happens, God is with us. Regardless of what happens, we can trust Him. That is what the shield of faith is. Think about how powerful faith is. How does faith uh, uh, engage, you know, uh, allow people to do great things when they have faith in it, right? How do people go through extraordinary circumstances and come out with courage? You know, faith is able to, to you, know, uh, you know, move mountains, right? Faith is that powerful shield that God gives us that regardless of the circumstances, he will be with us and he will see us through it. And he will bring us to an eternal reality of where these uh, sufferings don't exist. And the other thing I just want to share briefly before we move on, suffering is subjective. What is suffering to one is, is not suffering to another, is endur endurable to another, okay? I know people who they get a hangnail and they're calling in sick. And they're crying out in misery. And I'm not trying to denounce people who have low pain tolerance, okay? I'm trying, I don't want to be insensitive here. But I also know people, and I have a family member, he literally broke his ankle, um, shattered it, shoved it in a boot, tied his lace around it, and worked, went to work the next day, never complained a day about it, okay? Suffering is subjective. Some people, when they don't get the right parking spot, they say, God, where are you? I thought you were my shield. You're abandoning me, Okay? So a lot of what we call trials and tribulation and suffering does come down back to our perspective. And I'm not trying to say there's not real suffering. But I also, you remember the stories of many of the martyrs who they were trying to get, you know, renounce this and, and, and give up on God. And they're being tortured. And the stories are they never felt the flames. They fell asleep without having any, uh, uh, you know, uh, apparent evidence of trial and tribulation because God was with them even in that circumstance and their faith helped them overcome. So this is a serious question of what it means for God to be our shield. And for Abram, 
trying to, you know, it's not Abraham yet. For Abram, God is coming to him in the midst of a difficult circumstance and saying, look, you've had trials in this promised land. Okay, I was with you and helped you overcome them. I'm going to continue to be with them. I will be unto you a shield. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Let's, let's uh, finish up on that verse. It's at the very bottom of the lesson on page 39, uh, the, the, the encouragement to read the reference. Does someone want to uh, pick up 1 Corinthians 10, 13 for us? Yes, please. Okay. So again, there, it's about the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God. It's not that we're not going to be tempted. It's not that we're not going to be attacked. Is that in the midst of the attack, God will not abandon us, and he will provide us with a way of escape. All right, we're going to slip over then to Monday and look at the Messianic promise. Genesis 28, 14, uh, the promise to Abraham is repeated. In you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then uh, this is uh, picked up in Genesis, or excuse me, in Galatians when Paul writes, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seeds and heirs according to the promise. Heirs according to the promise. What promise? All right. Okay. So the promise that was given to Abraham is now extended to us. Let's try to be a little more specific about what that promise was. What did God promise Abraham? Going all the way back to Genesis 12 and as referenced here in Genesis 28. In you and, all your, and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. What, what is that a reference to? How are all the families of the earth going to be blessed through Abram or through the descendants or the descendant. Right. So Christ is the fulfillment, the ultimate, ultimate fulfillment of how all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. How does Jesus bless all the families of the earth? It's not meant to be a trick question. This is meant to be a time of engagement. <laughs> exactly. Jesus is, is providing the way of hope and salvation for everyone who chooses to believe in him. So Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of how all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Jesus brings the hope of salvation to all. Have you been blessed through the knowledge and power of Jesus Christ? Okay. On a daily basis, absolutely. Think about the covenant promise made after the flood in which the Lord promised to not destroy the world with water again. What ultimate good would this be without a promise of redemption found in Jesus? What ultimate good would any... Now, this was the, the one that caught me on Monday's lesson. What ultimate good would any of God's promises be without the promise of eternal life found in Christ. Why don't you think about that? What good does it make for God to promise not to destroy the earth again with water if, there's not an, uh, if we don't have the promise of Jesus Christ? I, I don't think I said that the way I, I wanted to. I think it's actually a fairly profound idea. Okay, What would the promise of God's protection benefit us if... There's no eternal life. Okay, Think about it in this context. It was a great thing when God raised Lazarus from the dead, right? It's wonderful. He brought life back into Lazarus. Where's Lazarus today? He's dead. So while the promise of God and the power of God in that moment 
was a wonderful experience and brought hope and, and, and showed the power of God, it did not bring the ultimate result that we're all seeking. Eternal life. So without Jesus, without the final uh, 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 illustration and manifestation of the plan of God and, and God purchasing eternal redemption for us through the death of Jesus Christ and His resurrection, all the other promises of God are quite irrelevant. Aren't they? Sure. Absolutely. And I think this is a helpful context to remember as we are exploring the promises of God, as we are trying to understand the covenant of God, that ultimately they're all trying to lead us to the understanding of our need of Jesus Christ and the ultimate promise of redemption and, and eternal life. If we are only wanting the promises of God for this life, if we're only seeking and desiring and wanting to understand the promises of God for our, our, our temporal benefit here, we will miss that the big idea is, is that the promises of God are ultimately to get us ready for eternal life. All right? God promises that our food and water will be sure. Right? I think that's in Isaiah. I think that's in Isaiah. Your, wa- your bread and your water will be sure. Even though you walk through the flames, I will be with you. Right? There's lots of promises of God. Right? And that's one, that He will take care of us in these circumstances. If we think or if we want to interpret that as meaning that I will never suffer hunger, I will never suffer loss, I will never go through an experience that sears and harms me, and if I do, then that means God is weak and I'm not going to trust in Him, then we're missing the big picture. We're missing the idea that those promises are there to help us understand that God's ultimate plan is our eternal redemption. And that when we do suffer privation when we do suffer that there is still an ultimate promise that's right that's right I, I just think it's an important reality for us to remember when we think about the plan of God and how his promises happen in our life that that they always lead, they always attach to the ultimate promise of God, which is our eternal salvation. And anytime we uh, uh, forget that, or we are tempted to divorce it from that, it, um, it, it uh, kind of poisons the truth of the other promises of God. So let me, let me come back down to the bottom here of, of page 40. What is it about the promise of eternal life in a world without sin and suffering that has such an attraction for us? Could it be that we long for it because that's what we were originally created for and that by longing for it, we are longing for something that is basic to our nature? It tries to answer its own question there. I want to come to the first part of it. What is it about the promise of eternal life in a world without sin and suffering that has such an attraction to us or should have such an attraction to us? Yes. Right. Right. And yet the devil is a good deceiver. He tries to twist things to make it say like, you know, this world isn't that bad. You know, it's, it's got some problems. It's not that bad. I mean, how much better could things get, really? And, you know, it, it, sounds, it sounds almost silly in a, in, a, in a spiritual context, in a church context like this. But I think even in our own lives, we've all had our ups and downs, you know, in our journey. We've had times when we felt very confident. We felt as though we were, we were overcomers. We felt as though God was blessing us. And, and we became very comfortable. 
And, and maybe you even at times in your life looked and you thought to yourself, you know, God, um, I'm really kind of enjoying life right now. I know that you're going to come soon, but could you wait a little bit? Just wait a little bit because, you know, I just got the new cabinets installed. And those, those rosy red cherry cab, I'm just loving those. I hate for them to burn tomorrow. Or I just got the new car, Lord. And it's got, it's got that engine that just has got some pep to it. I know that you, I know there's stuff, but could you wait? Or Lord, I just got married. I mean, I want to have a family. Could you just hold off for a while? You, you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to be very real with you. I think if we were to be honest with ourselves, we've all at least kind of experienced, even at a subconscious level, at least an element of that. And of course, there's the downtimes too, where you're really struggling. Like, Lord, if you, can, if you could come now, boy, that would be really great. Okay? But the devil tries to, the devil will only an, allow enough suffering in your life to make you want to avoid God. Okay. Show. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. Yes. And I think it's well put. And, and I think when you go back to the promise of Abraham, remember the promise was, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Right? That's the promise of Jesus. That all the families of the earth should find blessing. Okay? Part of the role of the Spirit in our lives is to get our eyes off of ourselves and onto the needs of the world around us. Right? We should not be so focused on our comforts, our joys, our situation, and then judge uh, the, the plan of God based upon our comfort level. And say, God, I'm so comfortable now, I don't really care if the rest of the world is blessed or not. I'm, really, I'm fairly comfortable. The more we understand the promise of God, that it's, His blessing is for everyone, and if we look through the eyes of faith, and we're asking God to show us what His plans are, we will never contemplate asking God to delay, even for a moment. Okay? Let's go to the burn ward at the hospital and see the children that have third-degree burns and then say, God, come tomorrow. All right? Go to, the, go to the wing where people are having heart trouble and they can't breathe, and they're on death's door and they're struggling and they're suffering, and then say, God, come tomorrow. Or go to third world countries where children are suffering and dying for lack of food. Okay? And then say, God, come tomorrow. I'm not saying we should focus on the negative, but the promise of God is for the blessings of the whole world, not just you and me. Praise God that you're blessed. Praise God that we live in America. Praise God that we have comforts. Nothing wrong with enjoying that. But if we forget that the promise of Jesus is for the whole world, we will ask for him to come with all expediency. And until that time, we will make our focus blessing those around us, sharing the good news, inviting people to salvation through the power of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Um, so that's the promise of Jesus. It's not just your salvation, but it's so that you will have the same concern for others' salvation as he had for yours. All right, Tuesday. Doing all right? <laughs> the Messianic Promise, part two.
To enjoy true happiness, we must travel into a very far country and even out of ourselves. That's a quote by someone named Thomas Brown. I don't know who that is. Maybe they're a very wise, important person, but um, Gerhard Hosel thought it should be included in the program here. Look at the above quote written in the 1600s. Do you agree or disagree? So let's just think about that for a second. To enjoy true happiness, we must travel to a very far country and even out of ourselves. Interesting. Yes. Okay. I like it. Anyone else? To enjoy true happiness, we must travel into a very far country, even out of ourselves. How do you travel out of yourself? Is that a transcendental meditation? You project yourself and happiness is found? What do you think in the context of the lesson, the idea behind that is? I think it ties a little bit back to earlier to what I was saying is that we, if we're only focused on ourself, if we're only focused on ourself, we will not find true happiness. Do you, that's the battle, isn't it? And, and, and Paul talks about that in the book of Romans when he says, you know, woe is me, that which I want to do, I, I don't do, and that which I don't want to do, I find myself doing it, Right? He's struggling with that, that human nature that is so powerful in our lives, that selfishness, the sinful tendencies to put ourselves first and to avoid the good things we know. You know, I know I shouldn't eat that fourth donut. I know I shouldn't eat it, but it's right there. Ah, I'm eating it. We are struggling all the time with these things. All right. So let's talk about some Bible texts that talk about what God has promised us in Jesus Christ and how we can find happiness on those promises. I wrote a few. If, if you haven't uh, had a chance to do them, there's a few at the bottom of page 41, but I added a couple. Let's look at Romans 3.24. And there's going to be a couple here in the book of Romans, I think. Romans 3.24. You might know Romans 3.23 by heart, but Romans 3.24 This is one of the promises that should bring us happiness. You can read verse 23 with it as well. Kenneth, you got it there for us? Would you read 23 and 24 for us? Is that good news? <laughs> the bad news is in verse 23, right? For all have sinned and all fall, fall short of the glory of God, of the expectation, of the, uh, of the priorities of God. So that's the bad news. But what's the good news? Verse 24. We are justified by what? And what's the cost of His grace? It says being justified freely or as a gift of His grace. through redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. So what does that mean? Why should that bring us joy in the thought that we have been justified by His grace? It's not meant to be a trick question. We can be like Him. 
And what does that mean to be like him? Okay. <laughs> Right. Right. I think God is pouring out His Spirit now more so to those who will accept Him because He needs a people to be His family. No, it's good. I I, I want to hear the thoughts um, and and get us all thinking. So God promises that despite our weaknesses and our failings and our sins, He is still going to redeem us. Right? He has still purchased our salvation, and He offers it freely to us. We don't have to earn it. He offers it as a free gift. Now, with that free gift does come responsibility, and this becomes the Christian journey and the battle that people have when it comes to you know, keeping the expectations of God. But you come down to verse 31. Do we nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. So God's grace is not a license to sin. Okay? It's the promise that when we do sin and come to Him and accept His grace, He will forgive us. Right? That should give us enjoyment. That should give us hope. Man. So rude. <laughs> okay, let's pick up on a couple more of these promises. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 2. Verse 14, 2 Corinthians 2, one of the most interesting books in the New Testament is 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. Someone have that one for us here, 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Oh, that's an interesting translation. What version of the Bible is that? Is that NIV? Oh, I hadn't caught that in the NIV. Very good. He al it said he always leads us in the triumphal procession. Is that what you said? <laughs> Isn't that an interesting play on words? How could we be both captives and triumphant? And mine doesn't use the word captive, and it could very well be an intended part of the, the verse. And I, I think it brings up an interesting visual of, of what that means. Thanks be to God who always leads us, and again, Dean's Bible, as captives in the triumphal procession, or leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of knowledge of Him in every place. What's the promise there? What, what's the hope and the, uh, the, the, the promise it should bring us joy in that verse. Okay. Whoops. Almost blew my pen. Yeah, very, very interesting. The second part of it manifests through the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Uh, uh, we understand how our different senses affect us, and it's interesting that Paul uses this sense of smell here. If you ever walked into a place that has an aroma that's very attractive, no one has to say a word at all. It just speaks to you, whether it's a restaurant or a, 
you know, a garden or, or a barbecue or something. Nor- normally when I think of smell, I think of food. Um, uh, but, you know, it, no one has to say anything to it. It just all of a sudden speaks to you. Something's going on here, and it's, it's attracting me. It's, 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 it's an enjoyable thing. And, and Paul says that that's what our life should be like in Christ Jesus. Anytime we walk into a room, we don't have to speak a word. Our very presence and our ability to manifest the power of God in our life should speak to people through their senses. Anytime we go anywhere uh, because of Jesus Christ, there should be an improvement. The place should be better, not because of us, you know, we're fallen sinful beings, but because of the presence of God within us. Uh, That's a powerful thought. You know, the Bible says that we are are to be like salt, we're to be like light, right? We're to be the sweet aroma. How sad is the case that often the presence of Christians and Christianity does not bring the intended blessing. What does it mean that God always leads us in triumph or captives in a triumphal procession? What does that mean? Thanks be to God, Paul says. Thanks be to God who always leads us. What do you say? Are you thankful to God that he never abandons us? No matter what circumstance we're in, he is by our side. It goes back to that very first memory text of the lesson when Jesus um, in Matthew 28, 20 says, Lo, I am with you always, even till the very end of the world. I am with you always. In good times and bad, in times of trial, in times of victory and joy, in times of triumph, I will always be with you and lead you. Well, I I think it's a good place for us to maybe wrap up. Sorry we didn't get the whole way through. We got through Tuesday. Um, But I like the challenge at the end uh, to find Bible verses that talk about the promises of God. Study them, learn them, dwell on them. Um, Now more than ever, right? Now more than ever, we need these good thoughts these good promises in our life because what we're getting from the rest of the world right now does not reflect the things of God. It used to to a larger degree, I think, but I think as times go on and we get closer to the end of time, the messages that are becoming more common have very very little to do uh, with the, the holy and precious promises that God wants us to dwell on in our life. Does that sound like a, a good idea? Find a Bible verse or two this week that expresses something that God wants you to have in your life and make it your own. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, every time we come together, it's just an opportunity for us to fellowship, for us to study together, learn together. Um, It's not about any of us having all the right answers or all the perfect solutions, Lord, but we know that through um, the sharing of the word and the studying together and the contemplation of your promises, God, that we are strengthened and we are enlightened and our burden is lighter because of it. So, Father, thank you that we can come here today. I continue to bless the church and bless the services. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. With our new schedule, we're supposed to get done a few minutes early, and I think we we just made it. God bless you guys.